Are you one of our regular students for Self-Improvement Wednesday? Each week you get to learn something new and each week you get to test out what you've learnt on our website where there's already a pop-up test all about today's lesson. Your lesson this week, why does dark matter matter? Your teacher is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer in charge of the Anglo-Australian Observatory. You can hear him regularly, of course, on Adam's Breakfast Program, I think coming up tomorrow, for instance. And uh, he joins us in the studio. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Richard. Now, tell us about the origins of dark matter. Uh, well, it's one of these things that astronomers love to talk about, even though we're very embarrassed about it, because dark matter constitutes four-fifths of the universe and we don't know what it is. Who discovered it? A man called Fritz Zwicky, who was a, 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 actually a Swiss-American-Bulgarian astronomer in the, in the 1930s. And in 1933, he observed some... Uh, galaxies in a cluster, and galaxies are huge aggregations of stars. But what you can do when you look at these things is you can measure how fast they're travelling. And he measured the speeds of these galaxies, but worked out that they were going too fast for the cluster to hold on to itself by its own gravity. Uh, if all that was... All, all that he could see was all that was there. So there must be some other glue. So he said, yeah, there's something else there. There's something holding these things back that stops the, the, the cluster evaporating. Um, and then um, the, the people didn't really take much notice of that because it's a bit embarrassing, you know, to find something that you really don't understand until the 1970s when an American astronomer, Vera Rubin, uh, she was observing individual galaxies. These, as I said, they're sort of like cities in the sky with hundreds of billions of stars in them. But one of the things you can do is look at the way these things rotate. And she measured the rotation of some quite nearby galaxies and, and realised that actually these things were spinning too fast, that um, by all normal logic they should fly apart because they, their own gravity wasn't enough to hold them together. So she inferred from that that th these galaxies had huge... Uh, invisible halos around them, hal spherical halos of, of something that was then called dark matter. So an invisible halo or a hula hoop, if you like, <laughs> yeah. around, around each of yeah. the galaxies? Actually, it's more spherical than circular, but uh, certainly um, that's what we think of them as these, as these halos of dark matter. And, and there were competing theories then, weren't there, in, in the 90s trying to explain this dark matter? Yeah, that's right, because the thing about it is that the only way it reveals itself is by its gravitational pull. Um, we can see it pulling galaxies so they don't fly apart. You can see the effect. You can see the effect, but you can't but see the, the stuff. Yeah. And so, that, for example, it, didn't, it doesn't silhouette against anything else. You know, if you've got something bright behind it, it there's no silhouette. So um, we would no idea what it was. And the two theories that were competing in the, in the 80s and 90s were wimps and machos. <laughs> and wimps and machos. Wimps now, and they're, machos. they're both acronyms, aren't they? Oh, how did you guess? <laughs> <laughs> wimps are weakly interacting massive particles, which means that they're subatomic particles. And machos were things called massive compact halo objects. And the idea was that these were uh, things uh, like failed stars. We know that some stars don't get to a sufficiently large size or temperature for normal uh, nuclear processes to take place. So they don't start shining. And there's a whole class of objects like that called brown dwarfs, which are actually very, very faint, but you can nevertheless detect them. But in the 1980s and 90s, people were thinking, well, perhaps there are many, many of these um, sort of sub-dwarf stars, mm -hmm. stars that, that, that haven't really switched on, but have mass and have gravity. And if, you've, if you can measure those in the hundreds of billions or perhaps even hundreds of trillions, then maybe they constituted the missing matter. Okay, a, a nice theory, but in the end they decided that the macho theory did not work. That's right. There's evidence from other sources now that machos are probably not the origin of, uh, of the dark matter. Which leaves us with the wimps. The wimps, that's right. <laughs> and, uh, and the, the wimps, uh, is the wimps now the leading theory? Yes, it, it is. Um, uh, I mean, one of the things is that uh, we, we now have techniques for actually mapping where dark matter is. So we know a lot about it. And, and it, uh, there's a technique called gravitational lensing. Gravitational lensing. Isn't it lovely? Yeah. yeah. What it means is that if you've got something very massive, it distorts space-time and actually bends light. It behaves just like a, a lens, in fact. It's a slightly unusual lens. You can, you can make one, actually, if you want. You can get a wine glass and break the bottom off once you've had a few glasses of wine. And that cusp shape of the bottom of the wine glass mimics what a gravitational lens look like, looks like very accurately, only, of course, on, on a scale that the gravitational mm -hmm. lens is billions of times greater. So do we imagine that we imagine, presume, that dark matter was always around in the universe? Yes, that's right. Um, that, you see... One of the things that people have realised by mapping where dark matter lies is that it likes to be where 
bright matter is it uh, and a uh, kind of normal matter which really is hydrogen hydrogen's the normal matter in the universe or the basic of the normal matter in the universe and so the idea was that in the very early universe when um the the big bang was a recent event you know perhaps within the first few uh, million or so years uh, the universe was very rich in dark matter and that dark matter clumped together under its own gravity and that clumping process actually attracted the normal matter that the hydrogen in the universe and when hydrogen collapses under its own gravity it turns into stars because so we, we see it almost uh, for a, met- a metaphor might be like a magnet which pulled the hydrogen almost that's it. right yeah. except it's using gravity rather than magnetism mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so you know, know that the, the dark matter's there it's fundamental to the uh, existence of galaxies and things like that because it's kind of seeded the, the gravitational collapse of these things and basically switched on the lights of the universe by attracting uh, gra- uh, hydrogen so so important but we can't see it what is it what is this stuff um this crazy <laughs> glue of the universe <laughs> Uh, I used to I used to have a wild theory that that it was testosterone which would prove that God was male, but um, but that's gone by the board for all kinds of reasons. The and universe actually, is bald. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But it's actually the best theory is that it's something like. Um, the, the, there's uh, subatomic particles that we know exist which are called neutrinos. Now, we know that dark matter isn't neutrinos because neutrinos don't have enough mass to constitute the dark matter. But neutrinos do have the property that they hardly interact at all with ordinary matter. So neutrinos are passing through our bodies as we sit here now, millions at a time uh, per second, without interacting in any way. In fact, they go through the Earth. They, they'll sail, th- sail through the Earth and one neutrino will say to the other, was that a planet we just went through? because they don't interact with with anything normal. So the theory is that it's something like that, but something that has matter, mass, I beg your pardon. So uh, the best theories are something called um, axions or neutralinos, but the, 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 the key aspect is that these are exotic, subatomic particles whose existence has not yet been proved uh, but that they hardly enter, interact at all with normal matter even though they've got such an impact on the universe I, I, as a whole in terms right. of our study of it there's there's hope that this new instrument might help isn't there there, there is yes um, one of the sort of holy grails of modern physics because this is this is sits firmly in the boundary between astronomy where you observe the effect of this stuff and physics where you're trying to understand what's actually going on uh, one of the, the the big new things in physics is a thing called the Large Hadron Collider, which is being built in uh, both Switzerland and, and uh, France because it straddles the border. And it's a huge machine. Uh, the the, the uh, distance, the, the circular path that these, nutri- uh, sorry, these neutrons have to take when they're being accelerated is 27 kilometres, so they're whizzing backwards and forwards across the Swiss-French border, showing their passport every time. And the, the idea is you collide um, neutrons. And when you do that, you create huge energies uh, of collision and those energies, we hope, will be sufficient to disrupt some of the more exotic particles that, new, that physicists see as the, the zoo of subatomic particles that make up the universe. And we hope that they will give us clues to neutri- neutralinos and axions and all the rest of it and tell us what this dark matter is. Are they allowed to get two litres of wine on each <laughs> passing of the border? Um, I don't think it works quite like that. There's no duty-free <laughs> allowance for neutrons. <laughs> for neutrons. <laughs> As always, Fred, uh, when you describe science uh, and uh, space to me, I, I feel as you're talking that I understand it. I wonder what will happen tomorrow when I wake up, whether I'll still be able to explain it to myself. <laughs> I have the same problem myself, you, Richard. You, you, you give me this curious <laughs> idea that you know I'm, I'm intelligent for a moment and I understand... <laughs> We'll see if it lasts. Thank you for coming in. Lovely to talk to you. There you go. There's there's, uh, Fred, one of the great uh, discussers of science. He'll be back with Adam on Brecky tomorrow. Remember, as always, you can test yourself out with Fred's questions on the website. How much of today's lesson will you be able to recall? Do you remember whether the wimps or the machos won out in that great battle in the 90s? abc.net.au slash sydney slash Richard Glover click on self-improvement Wednesday remember there are podcasts of all our lessons so far on the website you can give yourself a crash course next time you walk the dog or whatever next week camouflage, mimicry and self-defence in the animal world with Martin Robinson from the Australian Museum